I now move on to the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was made in Genesis 15, where it says, uh, this is when God make, made the covenant with Abram, uh, later called Abraham. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And this promise is going to build off, of, uh, this covenant is going to build off of the promise. The promise made to uh, Abraham in, or Abram as he was originally called in uh, Genesis uh, 12, uh, 1 through 3. There it says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This promise in Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is a promise of land. I'm giving, I'm going to do uh, uh take you to a land. It will have descendants or seed, literally in the Hebrew, and there will be blessings both on him personally and uh, through his seed all the families of the earth will find blessing. From Abraham's perspective, in the near future his descendants would find the blessing of possessing the land given to them by God but in the distant future, there's a universal blessing culminating in God's work in Abraham's seed. Uh, as Galatians uh, 3 and verse uh, 8 puts it, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So Paul saw in this promise to Abraham of land and seed and especially blessing in which all uh, the uh, uh, nations would be blessed through you as the gospel, the good news. Now in the case of this covenant, uh, the covenant with Abraham was uh, initiated <clears throat> entirely with God. The theme of righteousness is central to the covenant concept because uh, as the covenant was being given to him, Abraham, it says, believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And so it was received in conjunction with faith. And like most uh, covenants, uh, covenants tended to be ratified by sacrifice. And you have the account of how Abraham took uh, animals and cut them in half and walked. And God uh, went between the pieces as he swore an oath to, on his own self that he would keep the covenant and in particular give the land uh, promise to Abraham. Genesis 17 continues to elaborate on this Abrahamic covenant. As it's elaborated on in chapter 17, the initiative again lays with God. Uh, covenants are not uh, with between God and man or not between equal partners. And the passage goes on to describe how Abraham was given a new name. He was originally called Abram. He was given a new name, Abraham. Meaning may be similar, but uh, father, uh, you know, exalted father. But uh, the uh, uh, change of name symbolizes the new relationship with God. Same thing, Sarai is given the new name Sarah. Again, they may just be dialectical variants of the same name, which means something like princess. And yet uh, the new name 
symbolizes that now they have a covenant relationship with God. It also assumes that both covenant partners uh, will have certain responsibilities. Uh, God commits himself voluntarily to Abram and to his descendants. Uh, God's stipulation for Abram was, verse 1, walk before me and be blameless, Genesis 17 and verse 1. And uh, the essence of the covenant relationship then was that they were to live in his presence with a life of integrity, walk before me and be blameless. But then the sign of this covenant was circumcision, that all the 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 boys were to be uh, circumcised, the cutting of the foreskin of the penis, uh, on the when they were eight days old, as Genesis 17 and verse 12 uh, says. And this relates to the seed promise to Abraham, that he had many descendants, and now uh, even the uh, organ of procreation is, as it were, consecrated to walking before God and being blameless. I move on to the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is the main covenant in the Old Testament. God offers Israel a covenant in Exodus 19 as they have come to Mount Sinai. Uh, then he gives the law to Moses who presents uh, the law to the people and the covenant is ratified uh, by the people's acceptance of the covenant in uh, Exodus uh, 24 and the offering of a sacrifice to ratify that covenant. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything that the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said, and he got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he sent uh, young Israelite men, and they offered uh, burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings uh, to the Lord. Now, the stipulations of this covenant are found in the law. That law consists of the Ten Commandments, which you can read about in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through uh, 18. And the other laws were given in what uh, scholars call the Book of the Covenant, uh, Exodus uh, 20, 22 through 23, and verse 33. Now, something that's interesting to note here is that the law was given to a people who had already been saved. God saved them out of Egypt and offers them a uh, special relationship after saving them. Exodus 19 and verse 4 says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He had saved them from Egyptian bondage. He'd saved them from Pharaoh's army and brought them to uh, himself. And he makes this explicit in the prologue to the Ten Commandments, where he says, Exodus 20 and verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God had already saved them. He had brought them out of Egypt and brought them to the land, uh, out of the land of slavery and towards the land promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, it's been noted that uh, the uh, pattern of the biblical covenant with uh, Moses has parallels with covenants seen elsewhere in the ancient Near East. Uh, this was first observed by uh, George Mendenhall, who used to teach at the University of Michigan. And it has been elaborated on by Old Testament scholars like Meredith Klein, who uh, pushed parallels between the Hittite covenant treaties and the uh, uh, covenant uh, as represented by the book of Deuteronomy. 
but uh, this uh, covenant pattern is uh, is like the treaties that we see uh, from the ancient Near Eastern world around the time of Moses and the years uh, thereafter. Bible laws are like the stipulations of treaties. In the case of Hittite treaties, Yahweh is like the great king, the Hittite king, the suzerain. He would be the covenant initiator, just as the Hittite king would be the superior party that would impose covenants upon uh, his vassals, while Israel would be like the vassal and covenant recipient. And what's interesting here uh, theologically is that a covenant relationship comes before the keeping of any laws. The laws are like stipulations of, a of the uh, Hittite treaties. The laws regulate a covenant or a treaty only after the covenant or treaty has been established and ratified. In other words, law keeping does not establish a relationship just as obeying the stipulations of the treaty doesn't, didn't cause the treaty with the Hittite kings to be established. <clears throat> Rather, covenant-keeping, law-keeping is an obligation for people only after they enter into the covenant. That is, only after they establish a relationship. In other words, salvation is by God's gracious offer of a covenant relationship. It was not earned by works of law-keeping, even in the Mosaic Covenant. Salvation precedes law-keeping. Law-keeping is a way of showing gratitude to God for the relationship and living in accordance with that relationship. It was not the means of establishing the relationship. This is elaborated in Deuteronomy where it emphasizes that this Mosaic Covenant was based on God's grace. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8, the Lord did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh of Egypt. It wasn't because you were so uh, great. It was because God loved you, and he keeps his promises. Uh, Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6, After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, The Lord brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it's on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then it is not because of your righteousness uh, because the Lord your God is, is, is that the Lord your God is giving you this land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. It wasn't because you were so great; it was because God loved you. It wasn't because you were so good; you're stiff-necked people. But God, in His grace, offered the covenant and the benefits of that covenant relationship with His people. So some concluding remarks on the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant shows that God is a God of justice and righteousness, that he demands justice uh, of a people in covenant relationship with them. And yet, Israel in no way merited their covenant relationship. The law had a sacrificial system to deal with covenant failure. You'll read about that in Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 7. In other words, uh, God knew from the beginning that they would not be able to merit a relationship with covenant uh, by, by, by law keeping, but uh, had built into the system a way of dealing with covenant violation and failure so that sin would not uh, lead God to destroy them. Again, the covenant is ultimately based on God's grace and and uh, unmerited favor on the part of the Israelites. <clears throat>